around the country. Lawrence Krauss, professor of physics at Case Western Reserve University and author of Adam, an odyssey from the Big Bang to life on Earth and beyond. And Michael Behe, professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University and author of Darwin's Black Box, the biochemical challenge to Darwin. Welcome to both of you. I'd like to start with you, Professor Krauss. Pres the president said both sides ought to be taught. What do you think? Well, it's a completely inappropriate remark, unfortunately. Uh, whatever he may think individually, what he's done is give credence to, a, to a, a, a concept that's really been proposed by a very small group of people that doesn't appear in the scientific literature. It's really quite marginal. To see. It's part of a very successful marketing and public relations campaign by a well-financed group, the Discovery Institute, of which Dr. Behe is a member. And it shows how you can take something that, from the scientific perspective, is really irrelevant and make it uh, appear to be an incredibly controversial issue, which it isn't. Professor Behe, why don't you give us your reaction to what the president said? Well, I, I was very pleased. This, this whole debate about whether one can detect uh, design in nature goes back thousands of years to the, the ancient Greek philosophers. You know, where Aristotle and, and Democrates argued over whether there was design in nature. And it's important to realize that all, all biologists readily acknowledge that the appearance of design, at least, is very strong in life. Uh, a man named Richard Dawkins, who is a very strong Darwinian biologist, nonetheless says that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Uh, so uh, we're talking about an, uh, a very uh, ancient and ongoing argument. But the critique, Professor Behe, you just heard from Mr. Professor Krauss, is that you don't have the evidence that it's more a kind of marketing campaign. It hasn't gone through the scientific literature. Well, I disagree that the scientific literature uh, contains uh, many, many examples of very complex systems that everybody says appear to be designed. Uh, when Darwin uh, wrote his, uh, his book on the origin of species, uh, he was ignorant, and all of science was ignorant, about the molecular basis of life. In the past 50 years, uh, the progress of science itself has discovered that the very foundation, the molecular foundation of life, is enormously sophisticated and elegant. There, there are molecular machine or machines, there are little trucks and buses and outboard motors that shuttle supplies around the cell. And the term molecular machine is used routinely in biology. Biology uh, is, is just filled with terms that, that imply design. Professor Krauss, uh, help, help the lay person understand this. Do you and other scientists just not see these machines? No, in fact, actually, understanding molecular machines is a, a kind of interesting area of physics nowadays. And, we're t and there's been a great deal of progress in understanding how the laws of physics and chemistry can naturally produce these devices. To say that there's an appearance of design is a reason, first of all, it's a subjective thing. Some people see design and some people don't. But to suggest that that's a reason to, that there must be design is crazy. If you look at a snowflake uh, under a microscope, you'll see an incredibly elegant structure. But I don't think Dr. Behe would argue that it was designed. If you look at a geodesic dome on Earth, you might say, well, that was designed by Buckminster Fuller. But if you look at the uh, the, the molecule C60, which is made up of carbon atoms, it's a, it's a geodesic dome. But uh, again, it's, we understand how natural laws of physics uh, produce this. this. And, and, and to say that this has been appeared in the scientific literature is just ridiculous. A colleague of mine did a study recently of, of uh, 20 million scientific articles over the last 20 years. Uh, in that, if you do the keyword evolution, you'll find about 115,000 hits. If you do intelligent design, you'll find 88 hits. Of those 88, all but 11 were in engineering journals where you hope there's intelligent design. Of the remaining 11, eight were critical of intelligent design, and the other three were, weren't in, in research journals. So it, it, it's really a marginal notion, and it's I have no problem with people exploring it, but if they want to explore it, they should explore it the way the rest of scientists explore it. They should publish articles, perform experiments, do tests, uh, fight with referees, and after maybe 20 or 30 years, if they convince their colleagues then maybe it'll get in high school textbooks. But what these people want to do is the opposite of fairness. They want to skip all those intermediate steps and say, let's forget doing the actual studies. Let's go directly to the high school classroom. And that's the opposite.
opposite of fair play, really. Well, Professor Behe, how far do you want to push this? The question on the table and the question the president raised is, should it be taught in the high school classroom? Should it be taught in a science class at this point? Well, uh, let me make it clear. I'm not trying to push anything. All I'm doing is advancing an idea. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it was the president who, who talked about education. High school education is, is not my particular area of interest, although it's, it's very important. Uh, my own feeling is that I think talking about it would be very exciting. It would be an excellent pedagogical tool to introduce high school students to a, a, a variety of topics that get short shrift in science, but are nonetheless very, very important. That is, uh, um, how do assumptions, how do assumptions affect what theories uh, are produced? Uh, how far can one extrapolate data? Uh, can you extrapolate uh, small changes in current organisms to enormous changes over billions of years? Um, there are uh, many, many, uh, many, many other questions about how scientists develop theories, test them, uh, come to a social consensus about what is permitted and, and what is not. And I, I think just pedagogically, I, I can't understand uh, why a Darwinian biologist would be reluctant to have these issues discussed in the classroom. Darwinian biologists, and, and Professor Krauss, of course, is not a biologist, but he's a, a sympathizer. Nonetheless, Darwinian biologists seem to think that their, their theory is extremely strong and yet are afraid to uh, discuss other theories. Uh, that, that, that's a curious position as far as I can see. Well, Professor Krauss, go ahead and respond. Well, it, it, that's a, a standard argument that Dr. Behe uses, but it, it's, it's uh, ludicrous. In fact, of course we want to discuss interesting, new, controversial ideas in science. Unfortunately, intel intelligent design isn't one. If Dr. Behe wants to push the idea, what he should do is instead of going out and lobbying states to include it in high schools, what, the, what that group should do is, is try and do the science, try and convince their colleagues. You know, in physics, there are, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of articles on challenges to Newtonian gravity, ideas that Newtonian gravity changes on the scale of a galaxy. But I don't see people saying we should, in high school physics classes, not teach gravity. There's an idea where people have actually tried to propose tests and make alternative theories that really make sense, and people are actually exploring them. I think they're likely wrong, but people are actually exploring them. But intelligent design hasn't even reached that. There are basically no scientific articles, no proposals. It hasn't affected the essential thinking of the way biology is performed, and until it does, there's no reason to talk about it. Of course we should discuss how scientists arrive at theories, and it's a great idea, and maybe we should use Newtonian gravity as an example, because as far as I can see, the uh, challenge to that is much greater than the challenge to uh, evolution. Professor Krauss, uh, many, many critics of this idea of intelligent design have pointed to it as a kind of backdoor way to bring God back into the high school classroom. Do you see that as what's going on? Uh, absolutely. I have to say that, that if you actually look at the literature of groups like the Discovery Institute, it's very clear, and that's the reason I as a physicist are involved in this, uh, it's very clear that the attack is not on evolution, it's really an attack on science. The notion that because science doesn't explicitly mention God, it's somehow immoral. In fact, that's in the literature if you read what these people are saying. And, and, and so, for me, the point about science is it's neutral when it comes to God. There are incredibly devout and spiritual biologists and physicists, they're atheists. And the fact that those same sets of people can work on the same science, evolutionary biology in particular, indicate that the science is neutral. And that's the way science should be. Science is not all of human knowledge. It's a very specific discipline that says, let's try and look at natural causes and na uh, that might explain natural effects. And, you know, that may not, that doesn't explain everything in nature. And it's unfortunate with science scientists suggest that science is all there is, that there are other, or aren't other kinds of truth. But it works pretty well, and it's the basis of our modern technological society. And I, as someone who likes to talk about science and wishes people knew science better, uh, get, a, get worried when instead of trying to promote thinking about science, we're trying to attack it and suggest that the scientific method itself is somehow suspect. Perfect. And that's the real, the real danger. Okay.